Hey folks, it's 5.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, August 17, 2018, I'm told. I announce that usually, beginning of most videos, because uh, I like to record. I like to keep records of things that happen, that really do happen. Um, unlike our you counterpart, who seem to have uh, hidden a lot of the records of what's actually happened and or edited or changed them. Now, I'm not making any claims as far as uh, how extensive and prolific that is. I would say extensive and prolific enough to uh, entirely disorient the world. Basically, all the people of the world. Unfortunately, uh, most people can't say that, well, this or that individual specific country definitely has records that have not been sullied by these folks. And so we should be able to use those to extrapolate back and understand a great deal about our world that we didn't. Yeah, well, I wish that were true. Unfortunately, it is very clear that uh, these folks have been at uh, their internationalism for far, far longer than most of the Twoofer channels would make it out. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have a lot of answers because I don't. All I can do is take what information I gather and pray about it and come up with uh, the best thing I can. Today I'm not making the, a video uh, on a, a rock solid or um, unidirectional topic. It's going to be on a few things because uh, this is just one of the ways that I'm able to uh, kind of loosen the uh, pressure cap on the cooker. I've been at a couple of very specific documents for, well, probably since about uh, a day after I made that first video, which was called Exodus to Entrance. And um, that was also actually based on a document that I had done some months ago. I realized after I did it, and um, given uh, where the then nation of Yisrael was staying in Mitzrim, in this uh, area, the Aretz Gashan, in a more specific place called Romsis, not Ramses, uh, Rom, R O M S S, Romsis. I, uh, I started doing a word study on the roots in Romsis, and I found some uh, really interesting things, of course, that um, most people aren't going to see with their Juden goggles on. Uh, we've got to remove the Juden goggle and take a fresh look at all of this stuff. So... Uh, part of what I'm going to do today here is uh, hopefully assist in the removal of the Juden goggle. Uh, oh yeah, and also, since I am seeing a just an absolute, uh, very direct and prolific campaign against those who are telling the truth about the JP. A lot of people call it the JQ, but it is the JP because it is a problem. Those people, they're being shut down. And of course, uh, YT is giving the reason in most cases because uh, they, violated, they violated the community guidelines, which is code talk for we caught them telling the truth about us. 
I mean, there were literally any of us on YT telling the truth. We are in enemy territory. They, I have to hand it to them, they certainly have been, huh, I don't want to call it masters, to be honest, because I don't know that mastery is an appropriate term. They certainly have been practicing sophistry for so long. Uh, I don't know if there exists another people that are uh, capable of such a snake-like lying tongue as they tend to have. Very smooth, very subtle, far more subtle than any beast of the field. So, if they should catch up with me, and it's time that they decide that uh, I've uh, violated their community guidelines by telling the truth, we don't want bullying. That's what they say. We don't want bullying because what we define bullying to be is telling the truth about the uh, ravenous, child-molesting, murderous, thieving, uh, just a seed of Satan, well, however you want to define Satan, that they are. <laughs> <laughs> and they get away with it too. They have been. They have. They've been getting away with it. When, on the other hand, you have droves of people out there who uh, they simply want to live a life of integrity and honesty. They want to, in my case, in the case of a number of people. They want to live as honest and virtuous and obedient life before the living God as possible. There are even many people out there that are self-professed atheists that want to live as virtuous a life as possible. Of course, you're going to have to come to some kind of a, uh, a standard of rule of morality and ethics. I don't know how you do that without a lawgiver, but I guess that's, that's a whole different uh, topic and debate. But that's what we want, most of us. That's what we want. And unfortunately, uh, it seems like as of this moment in time, uh, most of the people who want that are yet still sleepy. Um, Many selfish, even. Uh, many not selfish, but they've been convinced of a lot of very untrue things about what the Bible says. Say who their Messiah is and what he said. What their future eschatologically ought to be. And who their enemies really are. And I got to tell you, I pray nearly every day that uh, the eyes will be opened of those who are blind and sleepy. Some of the good news is, if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39 about Gog, you'll find that all of those of Yisrael in the latter days who don't believe, they will believe after the great work that Yahweh works in Yisrael after they are back living in the land in peace in unwalled villages. This is when Gog brings all the hordes of all kinds of different nations in among them as to destroy them. But it isn't so, it isn't going to happen. Uh, you can tell from my YouTube channel and the picture that I put up that I'm a white male. I encourage people of all different races to come here, get what they can out of my channel, 
uh, because I personally, I don't have any kind of necessary beef with people of other races, whether they be black, brown, yellow, whatever they may be, various shades of white, their ethnicities and backgrounds. I have a problem with those who would do evil and harm to others. Oh, that includes white folks too. So let us let us be very clear about that. <clears throat> I would have to say, <coughs> excuse me, I'd have to say I think that everybody should uh, assess and really put their mind to the understanding of the times that we're in and the peoples that we are and be sure not to join in the scheming and the uh, pot stirring that those folks with their little hats do to try to stir up all the rests of the kinds of peoples against the elect of Yahweh. Unfortunately, for them, that's going to go very bad. For them, I, I think it's going to go very bad for those who are traitorous to their own as well. You see, we live in a big, 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 great, big, huge world. There is enough space for everybody. And some, and some, and some. All of the lies they've told us about the lack of resource and the lack of space, well, they're lies, aren't they? So, I find it so unfortunate. Because I was one of these. I was fooled and deceived for most of my life. Uh, I, I've even been fooled many times in the last few years trying to search for the truth of things by various people. So I know how it feels. I, I know what it's like to be right there. Uh, to know I've, I've been deceived. There's no shame in admitting you've been deceived or you've been wrong. There is only shame in once you realize that hardening your heart and your conscience against that and proceeding as if nothing has changed. That's the shame. That's the guilt. It's the blood guilt. So let's see. I want to talk about a few things. Remember, it's not unilateral. There's going to be eh, kind of a few different things that uh, I planned on poking at this time, since I'm pretty much just about done with these documents I had to write. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the one document, which was, well, I've titled the document Pasture Land Table. And there's a really good reason for writing this document. Now, at this point in time, I'm at uh, 11 pages. I've just started page 11. And I've got to include the last few years of Jacob Jacob's life, which were spent in Mitzrim, not Egypt, Mitzrim. And then I have to go into the first chapter of Exodus. Take that population, extrapolate based on the numbers that I've already gone through of population, population growth, and with the understanding of uh who exactly is being named in the population. You have to extrapolate out from there. And understanding this, and this is really important to understand. When a population is given in the scripture, you have to pay close attention to uh, who the scripture is talking about, you see. Let me give you a good case in point. Jacob flees from his brother Oshu, Jacob and Esau. He is at the time that he flees from him. This is because he and his mother, Ribka, she's something. Her whole, her whole family is really something else, man. They uh <laughs> they trick Yitzhak. Now at this time Yitzhak could be about a hundred and thirty-four. And by the time he hits about 134, his eyesight has gone, for the most part, on him. And he's not in great health. 
and he is concerned that he doesn't have much time. And uh, and like we can see with uh, Jacob in uh, the land of Mitzrayim, he uh, he gives blessings to his twelve sons. Although there are thirteen tribes, don't let anybody ever tell you there's twelve tribes. There's thirteen tribes. Jacob had twelve sons. His second to the youngest son, Yusuf, had two sons, Minishe and Aparim. Yokup, upon blessing Minishe and Aparim, gave them blessings as his own sons. Aparim basically replaced Yusuf in a sense as a son, and Minishe was also added and given Yokub's name. You can check this. That's a fact. Thirteen tribes. I think part of the Juden goggles is the twelve tribe idea. There are thirteen. Thirteen tribes. It's just that Jacob had twelve sons. So anyways, Yitzhak, he's, he's old, 134. Now, people at that time, they did live far older at that time than they tend to today. Now, I wonder, uh, concerning, <laughs> concerning this idea of three score and ten that we have today, how much of that has to do with all of the poisons that are given to us in food, our air, our water, our minds, Anyways, uh, so you figure, Abram, he lived to 175. Abram's father, Thera, lived to 205. If you go back, the big age cutoff started at about the time of Pelag. Um, Pelag and his brother, Yuktan, were sons of Ober. And through Pelag on down, we got the title of Obri. We are Obri. Um, Sure. I mean, that may be mostly a, a language classification thing. However, you do have to, uh, you do have to take note that, um, when Abram, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, but especially Abram, when he first goes to the land of Canaan, he is communicating with various people in Canaan and Matsrim. Is he doing it all through a translator? We're not told, but he's communicating with them all. So somebody knows his language, and he knows somebody's language, or everybody had interpreters. But this whole idea of the advancement of kingdoms at that time, we'll probably get into later. Jacob is 134. So by the time he's 134, and it may be, I think, a lot of self-pitying, because Jacob lives to 180. So he lives another 46 years. <laughs> but uh, here's the thing. He, he may have been ill, and it may have been that he either contracted something or whatever it may have been that made his eyes go when they did. You remember his mother, Shira, she lived uh, only till 127. She... Uh, yeah, she died when Jacob was 37. So he's 134. He thinks he's close to death, and he's not sure. But he figures this is the time he wants to bless. He wants to bless the son he loves. But what happens is Ripka hears. She hears him tell Oshu to go out to the Shade and take his hunting weapons and bring him a certain game that he really loves and make it into savory meat for him, which I would imagine uh, by this time it would have been Oshu's wives or his wives' servants that would have done this for him because at this time Oshu has got to be about 74. Yokup and Oshu are twins, so they both be the same age. Now Oshu, in the chapter before, he takes two wives of the Canoni at age 40. 
34 years later. So a couple of his sons are grown by this time. Yeah. See, now this is where all of this gets oddly complicated. And do not be upset with me because you say to yourself, well, he's not staying on path. I just want him to make his point about Isaac and Jacob and just get on. Don't do that to me. The, what you have to understand is these things are really complicated. And they're complicated for a reason. That's one conclusion I've been able to come to over the course of this paper I've been writing. The Bible, and I can tell you this about Genesis, and uh, given the, the books that I've also studied in what's called the Old Testament, I can say this relatively definitively about most of them. The Bible seems to be written purposely in a complicated way so that the one who really wants to understand they can't do this in a, a kind of a relaxed remedial way where they just get their little bit of readings in here's and there you know and maybe maybe they'll do their daily uh what are those dedications like daily bread? <laughs> I'm sorry. Those things are a joke to me. I can't help. I, I don't know. Maybe I've got a sick sense of humor. I probably do. I really don't care. <laughs> I don't know of anything more confusing than things like that. Uh, <laughs> the dedications and stuff. I did my daily dedication. And here's how I feel. Well, anyways, uh, that seems to be pretty clear. And the Bible is purposely written by, and, and here's another one of those fingerprints things, by the various authors who you can tell were various authors by their language styles and writing styles. <laughs> however, however, uh, they all share the same voice. Now that, that is an anomaly every atheist or person who practices polemics against the Bible must overcome. So yes, it is written in that way. Um, and because of this, it just goes to show you that that popular proverb is absolutely correct wherein it says it is the kabod glory of Yahweh to conceal a matter but it is the honor of Melek kings to search it out <laughs> he didn't write it in a way that anybody with a half a heart could fully understand it that's a fact. There's probably a reason that um, not only my channel, but the very few channels out there who are uh, disseminating, I think, good truthful content. They don't get a lot of subscribers. I'm like nine short of 777. It's pretty cool. Hopefully I'll get a screenshot of that when it reaches 777. I like sevens. I like sevens because Yahweh likes sevens. My father, he likes sevens. And that's why there's 66 books in the Bible. <laughs> so, so, okay. Let's get back to uh, Yitzhak and the blessing and Oshu. Now, he, he asks him, and I, I'm not going to go over the Obri with you because that really would stretch this out way longer than I even intend. But you can look. You can... Uh, reference these things he tells him he says go out and catch me some savory meat like I love and bring it to me have it prepared bring it to me I want to eat it so I can bless you <laughs> it's, it's really weird right because um, Jacob I mean he didn't 
he didn't ask his sons to do something like that. This is just a little weird. I don't know. Um, Yitzhak's a little weirder. I don't want to say weird. He's not. He's a different person than Abraham or, or his son, Jacob. So Ribka hears this, and she goes and gets Jacob. And she says to him, <coughs> she says, now this is how it's translated. It's translated, go get me two kid from the Ozim, and which they'll say is goats. Uh, first off, they translate what he asks for from Oshu. They translate it as venison all the time. And of course, they, they typically translate when she's saying, go get me two kids, that word as kids, and then the ozim as goats. If, if you do a search uh, online with guys who are hunters, who, who kill a lot of different wild animals, especially deer hunters, and see what they say that deer taste like. Um, uh, there's almost none of them will tell you that they taste like goat, even young goat. Um, in fact, and then you can you can go and find out from people who have uh, are big goat eaters, or or you can find pages, threads, and stuff people who have eaten goat for the first time, either um adult goat or younger goat, and what they have to say about the flavor of that meat. <coughs> because here's the thing. They have to fool Yitzhak. So whatever it is that Ribka tells Jokob to go and get these two young animals so she can prepare them. First off, she's probably taking a certain portion from each one and preparing that. I don't know what portion she's taking, okay? But that's probably why she asks for two. The portion she's taking from that... um there's probably not a lot of, and she knows that its flavor and its texture is going to be very, probably very similar to the flavor and texture that uh, Yitzhak expects from the game that Oshu would be bringing back. Because he names it, and it would have to be a certain kind of animal. Now, keeping in mind that I haven't found anything that tells me that either small lamb, and I've had lamb, various kinds of lamb, I've had goat, but it was so long ago that I had goat, I couldn't tell you. It wasn't bad, though. Um, I've had a number of different animals, but it's been a long time. However, I, I did do a search and found out that... The flavor of buffalo and bison uh, is a very, as far as wild animals go, and as far as we know, the buffalo and, and bison have always been um, a wild animal, um, not a tame animal. I know people can keep them in cages. People do today. Uh, however, it's been recorded, uh, you know, the great huge packs of buffalo and or bison that roamed this land just a few centuries ago. So I would think that it had always been considered a wild animal. This is not an animal I think that you can tame and herd easily. And although uh, people that raise bison for meat uh, will, yeah, they can keep them in an area caged in. Uh, I don't know that they are an easy herd animal, so you would have to go out and hunt them. I am going to have to interject. The more I read this, all of these uh, facts and events, the lives of, the particulars, and look up these strange details. Of course, the less of a the less I'm seeing them through the Uden goggles. Oh, so anyways, yeah. People say that buffalo and bison's very good. Very, very delicious, savory meat. It's wonderful. Now, it is possible. I'll just go. I'll just go to the verses here. It'll make things probably a lot 
<clears throat> excuse me, it'll probably make things a lot easier if I do that. So let me hit that real quick. Uh, it's in Genesis 28. So that I can show you some kind of interesting oddities to the text here and there, okay? Okay, so it's actually Genesis 27. It's not 28, it's 27. So he tells to him, to Oshu, um, Yitzhak tells him to take his weapons and uh, to go out, his hunting weapons. And what he's after is this word here that they have an asterisk by. And they do this a lot, actually. They asterisk a lot of words. And then they put in brackets. They say, well, this is what the word ought to be. Well, I would be very cautious of these things. Take them into consideration, but be very cautious of who has done this and what their motivations might be. So this tzide, okay, they say it shouldn't be tzide, it should be tzid. Now, this is not to be confused with shade, which is different. Like when it says that Oshu is a man of the shade, all right, tzide. This is the thing he wants. And Ribka and Yokab are going to fool their father, Yitzhak, with a different meat. So when she tells Yokab what to do, I'm going to get the exact words right here. Now she's relaying it to him. Bring me Tzid. So when, if Yokab says, Tzide, um, he could be referring to a type of animal, whether it be male, female, young or old. Anyways, so she's saying he wants this seed, and she tells him to go, <coughs> here we go, go to the flock. Now, all right, to good gadi should tell you a lot about the word gad and the translations of that. Now, of the oz. Now, if that's goat, and a lot of people say actually goat's very good, um, I don't think they can compare that to deer or venison. Everything I've read no one is comparing goat, even a young goat, to venison. They do say that it is very uh, rich, delicious meat. So if it is goat, it might more easily be compared to something like a bison. Also, there are other animals you will find if you really dig in deep that just simply can't match anything we know of to this day to live over and around the Middle East. They can't match these things up. So that's more of what it sounds like to me. And you can make your own judgments. Oz is one of those words within that 20% of the lexicography that they cannot prove. <clears throat> O Z. Now, I'm not trying to start any rumors here, any blasphemous rumors, <laughs> but it is possible that what we're looking at with O's is closer to something like ox. And ox is, of course, very closely related to cow, which typically seems to be boker or shur, or if it's a young cow, par. So I just don't think those match up too good. Venison with young goats, I don't think they're going to be fooling him if he asked for venison and they're bringing him young goats. So, let me move on past that.
because I am going to be heavily rabbit trailing in this video. That's what I said. So now, okay, Jacob steals the blessing from Oshu. Oshu, and at the time, their father Yitzhak was outraged. Outraged. Uh, it says, and it's a pretty close translation, that when he realized that he had been tricked by his son, uh, Jacob. And Jacob's, I think, a very different sort of person before he goes to Laban. This is where Yahweh's really starting to work with him. And he puts him in just that right situation to really work with him within. First off, running from Oshu because of what he did. Anyways, so um, I do want to cover a little bit of him running. So he runs. Now we don't know actually, this is part of the thing. This, these are the things that you got to fill in. Because the Bible is purposely not giving you these details. You have to fill these things in. You have to think. It's very important. We don't know what time has transpired per se. Um, between certain things. Like in the chapter before this, at 26, at the very end of 26, it says Oshu was 40 when he took the two Canaanite wives. Now, the reason that I would extrapolate up to the age of 74, because that makes a lot more sense concerning Yitzhak thinking he was close to death and losing his eyesight. 134 as his age makes a lot more sense. It also makes a lot more sense because if you were to say that he was, now remember, Yitzhak was 60 years older than Jacob and Oshu. So, if we're picking right up after Genesis 26, last verse says that Oshu was 40 when he took those two Kanoni wives, if we're picking up right from there, then Yitzhak's only 100. And it seems odd that his eyes would go dim. And the other problem is, Jokob has to, if this were the case, if this happened right around the age of 100 for Yitzhak, Jokob would have to have tarried in the land of Canaan. Still, he would have to have tarried uh, 30 years or so. Now, you got to remember, Oshu is hot at this point in time. And Oshu also believes that Yitzhak is maybe about to die. So what he says is, he says, I'm not going to kill my brother while my father is alive. He says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for him to die. And I'm going to wait for the morning to be over and I'm going to kill him. That's what he says. So I believe in haste, Ribka sends Yitzhak away. I don't think it's the day of or the next day because in the next chapter, it says that, well, she goes to Yitzhak, she starts pestering him, you know, about these wives that Oshu's married. Um, and she says, let's send Ioka back to my brother's house, back to Padam Aram, or Haran, which is where her father's house would have been. That's where Abram's servant, Elozer, goes. He goes to a city named after his brother in Haran. So she says, let's send him back there. I think this happened relatively quickly. Obviously, Yitzhak's calmed down a little bit from being super pissed that he got fooled. And he also gives, he does give a blessing to Oshu. It's just not the same blessing. It's different. It's not the full blessing. So I have to think these events happened quickly. So one thing I think that we have to keep in mind is that throughout a lot of these descriptions in these chapters from Abram on through to the end of Genesis, Unless you're being told specifically, um, the numbers that you're going to see are not going to reflect every biped there. All right. I will say every he napesh present is not often numbered. That's really important because <clears throat> this is part of the problem with the Yudin goggles. I've mentioned this before, but a few decades ago, 
uh, Ted Turner's network, uh, whatever it was at the time, TBS, I think it was. Maybe it was TBS. He had a couple networks. They were real up and coming, you know? And uh, they produced a series of utter, absolute propaganda in which uh, they were like, what, three movies about Abram, Yitzhak, and Jacob, in which, of course, they used the Jew actors to play them. <laughs> hey, you know, I, to this day, hear these guys that are supposed to be respected Bible sholars, shulars, showa allars. Um, honest to goodness, honest to goodness, they call Abram a Jew. <laughs> Uh, I, anyways, I, besides the fact that um, most Jews today, probably all Jews today, all Jews today, they can't prove their lineage at all, uh, back to the house of Judah. But remember, Jew is supposed to be an outcropping of the name Yehuda, the fourth-born son of Jacob uh, by his first wife, Leah. Uh, <laughs> so... Anyways, all right, Jacob flees. Uh, about the first place that they record him going to is this place called Bethal. It was originally called Luz, okay? But the author oftentimes refers to it as Bethal, even when it was still referred to as Luz. Now, this is the place where he spends the night. He has this dream, right, of a ladder with angels ascending and descending. And he sees Yahweh at the top of the ladder. He sees him there. And Yahweh says to him, he promises him that the land that he is sleeping on, he's going to give to all of his descendants. Now it says that, and I think this is a very bad translation, I really do, when it says that he put a stone like a stone as a pillow by his head. I don't think that's a good translation. First off, nobody would use a stone as a pillow. If you don't think that's true, I want you to go camping you don't have to go camping. You can do this in your own living room. Go find you a stone. And I don't care what kind of stone it is. Go ahead. Go to the river or the lake or something and see if you can find yourself a good-sized stone. And it can be the smoothest stone you want. I don't care. You don't have to get a jagged one. Get a nice smooth one. Bring it home. And, uh, and set up a nice little sleeping bag on your living room floor so that you are, you're already a little bit more comfortable, right, than if you would be out and about. And you go ahead and put that stone under your head and you go ahead and get a, a good night's sleep. I dare you. I don't think that translation is very good that he used a stone as a pillow. But there is some sort of it's actually a building material. The word that's used, it's often used as a building material. He's right near this place, Luz. Now, whatever it is that is put, however it's put, because I haven't been able to stop and do micro-translations of all of these things. All I can tell you is there are certain passages that are poorly translated. Then he sets this up as a pillar, and he calls the place Bethel. He sets up various pillars at various places, or piles, or altars, something you have to keep in mind. Not long after that, when he sets up the pillar, he ends up in Padan Aram. And apparently there are these different groups of Roe shepherds that have various types of livestock. And they're waiting at this place. And now, let's talk about wells. We have to. There's just no way to get through this without talking about some things. We're going to have to go micro to macro, macro to micro, and do some rabbit trailing. Not rabbi trailing. Rabbit trailing. You cannot possibly hope to water a 
heard with anything that we have been made to believe with our Juden goggles on is a well or the kinds of wells that the patriarchs and the people in these places described would be using. No. No. I'm afraid not. It's not going to happen. Whatever it is that they were setting up, for instance, when Yitzhak, Jacob's father, he is sojourning in this place called Gerar. Gerar would have to be a very large area, and it was probably considered an open area, although it was mostly grazed by Palestine shepherds, Roa or Roy. The wells that it says that he dug, if you extrapolate the amount of people and livestock he had to have, and you have to do honest extrapolations, and that's a big part of what is in this paper that I produced, that I'm almost finished with. You have to have some kind of system of mass watering of all of these animals. It can't just be a little hole lined with stone that you put a bucket down. I know that'll work just fine if there's few, and I mean few livestock and few people. That was absolutely not the case with Jokob, I'm sorry, with Yitzhak. And I'll be showing this in the paper. And I don't think that's the case either <clears throat> when Jokob comes to Padanaram. Now he's right outside of Haran, and it looks as though his uncle, Ribka's brother, Laban, lives just outside on the outskirts of the city of Abram's brother. And sometimes this area is called Haran, and at least once when Elozer, Abram's head steward, goes to find a wife for Yitzhak, it's called after his brother's name. We can call it Haran, but it appears Laban lives outside of Haran, probably in the suburbs, since every description I've seen throughout Joshua and Judges and the earlier books, it seems that most cities were set up as large walled cities with suburbs or hamlets all around them for agriculture. This is just a common sense way of doing this. Now, so there's going to be areas where they're going to have wells for the watering of herds. Now, the idea that that means that what we're looking at is a barren and bleak landscape of just sand and stone is not correct. First off, if you look at many of the Great Plains states in simply the United States of America, Canada, Mexico, I'm most familiar with those places and their geography, but if you're from somewhere else, you can apply this to the place that you're from. <clears throat> if you're from around England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, or any other place, you can understand that you can have extraordinarily large areas of land that are not dry, bleak, barren, desert places that simply don't have the appropriate water for herds to drink from. So you might locate a well close by. I think it just makes sense, I'm going to say, that you should be able to get to water in a well most easily in lands that are well fed, that grass grows relatively easily on. So it can be a good, nice land with good grass growth, but that doesn't mean that it has to have any kind of natural water source on the surface for animals to drink from. 
And it is just logistically not a good idea to have a singular hole in the ground where you have to bring buckets up from to feed the amounts of livestock that we're going to be talking about, especially with Yitzhak, Abram, and later Yokup. We have in this situation when it comes to Padanaram many various shepherds with various types of livestock, and they're waiting. Now they tell him, and I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of the translation in that passage. He asks him, why are you waiting here? What are you doing? Because first off, he asks him if he's in the right place. And they tell him, yeah. Okay, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Well, they're waiting because Rahel, who is tending the livestock of her father Laban, she would be coming. And not she alone. She, with her servants, I would imagine although I can't prove this and I'm not claiming to prove it, that they would have had claim over that well. And if they had claim over that, then part of that claim would mean only they were allowed to operate it. And what I mean by that is I would think that as part of having this well, you would be setting up... Um, whether it be trenches. Now, if you do that, you're probably looking at muddy water. And yeah, you know, a lot of animals don't have too much of a problem with that. If you pump the well water into earthen trenches, um, that sediment, it will settle relatively fast. And that's not a big deal. But if you have to feed a lot of animals in a short amount of space, you would need something like that, whether you are setting up perhaps uh, various clay trenches or what it is you're setting up. If you put all the time, the effort, I guess which translates into money these days, into it, you could call it your well. So they're waiting for her to come. Now here's the thing. The text says that Jacob moves this stone. All right, take off the Uden goggles and figure we're, we might not be talking about a great big stone on the top of maybe a four to five foot in diameter circular well, like we've often been convinced is what we're looking at. We could be looking at some kind of an operation that's far different. I'm not saying to have the knowledge of that. But it wouldn't hurt anybody to think on it and to look deeply into it, not just grab the first thing you might find that could have been written specifically for the Yudin Goggle people. So it says that he moves whatever it is, is blocking this thing from outpouring so that many people can water their livestock. What's weird, when you see the various things that it says that Jacob was able to do, I've actually heard some people say, <laughs> maybe Jacob was a, gi a giant. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, look, no, we know that there's giants. It says there's giants. There is actually giants inhabiting uh, all of the various lands that um, the descendants, the various different descendants, descendants of Abram um, were given as a possession in time. By Yahweh, we see giants um, inhabiting the land that Oshu uh, was given as a possession, and that the children of Amun were given as a possession, and the children of Moab, Amun and Moab, being uh, the sons 
of Lut uh, through his daughters. And, uh, okay, so Oshu being the son of uh, Yitzhak, and it is also said that the Amory and those people occupying Habarun when they come back in the land are children of giants too. Okay, so that's, I'm not disputing that. <laughs> Okay, but they're distinguishing those people as specifically as giants, not the seed of Abram. We don't know precisely where these giants have come from. I know there's plenty of speculation. That's wonderful. What I'm saying is we don't still absolutely know where these giants come from. Do they come from a mating between angels and uh, women? Maybe. Don't know. That remains to be seen, but we know there are giants. But there's no reason for anybody to believe that Jacob is a giant. So how is he able to move this great stone? It must have been great too. Maybe that's why the Roy, or shepherds, were waiting. Because Rahal would have come with a large contingent, maybe larger than them, to be able to move whatever it is whatever kind of hard surface we're talking about over whatever kind of engineered setup of a well we're talking about. Maybe she had the sheer manpower as opposed to the deed of ownership. But it says that Jokub moved it. Jokub? All by himself? Well, that's what the text says. You can check. It says Jokub moved it. Well, that's weird. Because, you see, it also says that up until that point in time, Jokob, for the most part, he was not the sort of uh, rough-and-tumble guy that Oshu was. It says that he was more plain. He spent a lot of his time indoors, probably reading, things like that. So, how is it that Jokob moved whatever this uh, great impediment was? To everybody giving their livestock drink. And I would tell you that here is the answer. And this is how you remove the Juden goggles. And read this again. And begin to understand. Throughout the descriptions of Abram. When he comes first into Canaan. The descriptions often just refer to Abram. You have Abram and Sheri. And then it becomes Abram and Shireh. It says that they go to various portions of Canaan. It says they go down to Matsrim. It says they sojourn in Gerar. They have a makeshift home for a very long time in this place called Mamara, which is right near Habarun. Abram. Shira. Now, sometimes, of course, there's her handmaid, Agar. They do mention her. His sons, Ishmael and uh, Yitzhak. It mentions the concubine Abram has after Shira dies. It does mention Elo <coughs> excuse me, Elozer when Abram sends him back to Padanaram to get a wife for his son Yitzhak. But the Bible is not going to mention all of the people that come with Abraham, except in very small, particular places, and you need to pay attention. Because once you can establish that the Bible's not going to mention all these other people with them, servants, maybe not servants in the way we think of them today, like in the sense of slaves, but servants nonetheless, you do realize that just within a couple of years after Abram gets to the land of Canaan, and him and his nephew Lut, they separate. Lut goes to the cities of the plains, and then this confederacy of kings. They come down, they're, they're killing, they're stealing all kinds of people, you know. And they take, they take people from the cities of the plains, specifically Lut and his family, and they take off with him. And it says that Abram, he takes 400 men that were born in his house and trained. These are men who are trained. They're men of action. 400 
men born in his house he takes. I'm going to give you a little time for silent reflection. I want you to think. Within the first few years of Abram coming to Canaan, he has 400 men of action, trained men, trained for this sort of thing, born in his house. This is before we extrapolate cattle, riches, property, more people. This is before we consider the blessings given by Yahweh to Abram, Yitzhak, and Jacob. It's repeated to all of them. They experience little war. And besides for when Abram has to go and get loot back, which Abram's not losing people, he's gaining. And besides the time that Yitzhak is in Gerar, which was during the time of a robe or famine, they're not experiencing a lot of wartime. They're experiencing good times. They're experiencing blessings. And Abram has 400 trained men born in his house within a few years of coming to Canaan. <clears throat> so if that is sufficiently sunk in, I think it's fair to say that when Jacob is sent away and blessed by his father Yitzhak and Ribka, his mother, uh, that he probably has a decent contingent of servants with him. They're just often not mentioned because they are not the central focus of the story that we're following in Genesis. This is how he sets up this pillar in Bethal, which might have been quite a pillar. This is how he moves whatever this impediment is for this well that all these shepherds are waiting on. This is in part, in part, how after 20 years with Leban, he comes out of there having a great deal of possessions that you can clearly see he did not get from Leban. He already had, and they simply grew as he was there 20 years. He comes back out. He has many people with him. You can read the portion where he is has first crossed the Yardan, and then after that he crosses the Yabak. Now you can go and look at a map of Palestine and answer for yourself why Jacob coming back into the land, because he specifically says he's going towards his father Yitzhak's house. Why would he cross Yarden first and Yabak second? That's a fun rabbit trail. Anyways, he has enough servants by that time to separate the various types of livestock animals he's going to give to Oshu as a present, to separate all of them, and to put servants over those various contingents of livestock animals. Then he has servants with the true groups that he divides near the Nahal Yabak. You just have to know that there's only going to be certain times when it's very important to the narrative of what's going on where servants are mentioned. These servants absolutely are Hinapash. They are bipedal, what you can call people. I don't care. I, I don't really have any judgments from anybody what they would consider them. 
And I'm not even saying that the Bible is saying that they are lesser, greater, or anything else of the such. They're just saying they're servants. For all we know, all of these people are of the exact same race. We don't know everything. But we do know that most times these servants are not going to be often referred to. It is simply the patriarchs, families of the patriarchs, that are going to be referred to. When you see something like laid in Genesis, and it gives an accounting of Jacob, his 12 sons, and their sons' sons, and it says how many uh, lives or souls of Jacob's house came into Mitzrim, the land of Gashan, and it says 70. Well, you can figure that that is 70 of Jacob's loins. And it's not taking into account all the rest of the Hinepash, the bipeds, the people with him. So I hope that that will make up for what seems to be a lot of strange oddities or holes in the text. And I'm looking at my clock. Yeah, this is already over an hour. So, whatever. But I have things to do. Um, got kids to get up. Get them off to... Uh... Oh, good night. Yeah. It's not up to us. We, we watch a friend of ours children a few days a week so it's it's not up to us you know to send them to a yugo goggle you you didn't goggle academy I, we we don't have a say in that <clears throat> but i gotta get them up and so these were just the things a uh, few things to share because pretty soon I'll, I'll be done with that paper it's actually two papers together and there's it's for a good reason there's a lot of good content uh, that I'll be able to share and go over in those papers, and then I will get back to um, that whole exodus to entrance thing, because it's fascinating. The places they go, the real descriptions about them, not the translated descriptions, the actual descriptions about them, fascinating as well. All of the details that are left out to us because of the Juden goggles. Fascinating. So, oh yeah. And I am going to, actually, in the meantime, once the papers are done written, I'm going to be digging into um, a lot of the material that I've been sent concerning Fomenko and his Maxima Correlation Principle and his chronological mapping to see if I can determine how trustworthy these things are, and if they are, and to a point, great. If entirely, great. If not at all, great. But at least I would like to determine these things. So, thanks again to the people that have helped to contribute to that. Um, I'm going to put in the description two things. One thing is going to be for the Obrey Project Patreon. The other is going to be it's the address to the website being built for the Obrey Project. It is not published yet. I'm still going back and forth with these people, trying to tell them, because they're doing the initial design. After they do the initial design, I will take over as the webmaster. But I have been trying to tell them, uh, people, I sent you a font. I created this font. You need to make that available for download on the resources page. And they keep, I don't know if this is an English problem thing. They keep telling me, well, we only have limited fonts that we can work with. And I keep telling them, no, this is, you don't get it. You're not paying attention. I sent you a font named this. I created this font. I am its maker and master. And I can tell you to put it on the page as a file for people to download. It's a true type file. Now, I won't approve the page until they get that right. 
I mean, here's the thing. They've done their, their best. I hope. But there's a lot of changes I have to make when they hand me the keys and I become the webmaster. I just want them to do the initial things, the simple things, you know, like making the, the font available to download. That's not, it's not that hard. So I'm going to put the address of that there too. And, hey, once that site's up, it's guaranteed to be up for a year. I will be taking on the responsibility of paying for that site by the month. I did go with, it's a package that guarantees good web presence uh, in search engines. Hopefully they follow through with their end on that. Um, <clears throat> good links to any types of social media. So when I have the ability or the help to establish more of a social media presence through that Obri project, I'll be able to do so. Um, now the Obri project Patreon is going to be put in there simply for the opportunity. For anybody who believes in what I'm doing, if you want to support it financially, there's the opportunity. If you don't, if you don't believe in what I'm doing, don't financially support it. Anybody or anything you give support to, whether it be in um, money or just you vouch for them or you put your back into it, any of that, you, you really should go into that with a good, clean conscience. Um, I had to pull funding on somebody I was supporting because my my conscience wouldn't allow me to support them because of what they uh, believed and what they were uh, telling people. So you have to do it with a clean conscience. All I'm doing is I'm providing an opportunity for you if you want to support in that way. I can't see me at any time, even if the support went way up, like it was a lot, you know, <laughs> I still couldn't see me actually um, discontinuing my work as a contractor because that would put me at the mercy of those people who were the patrons in, in, in any given way. That's a spot I'm not comfortable with being in at this point in time because of uh, all kinds of negative things that come with that. So know that. This is why I said when I first set it up that it, it doesn't matter how little or how much I get on that. I'm going to keep working at it. Now if I get more and I'm able to take more time away from work, me personally, then I can put more time in. So that's great. Um, or maybe the people that are currently working with me on this or um, begin to work with me in the future, they can do that and put more time in, more effort, more energy, that kind of thing. That's all it is. And no matter what, I'm going to keep at this. So um, that's it just for this video for the day. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me. I'll see you next time.